National Broadcasting Company presents Lights Out, a summer revival of the famous series which many of our listeners will remember. Tonight's story, the eighth and the last in this series, is called The Signalman. Lights Out, Everybody. This is the witching hour. The hour when dogs howl and evil is let loose on the sleeping world. Sit in the dark now and listen to Lights Out. calling to a man who stood beside a railroad track at the bottom of a deep and rocky ravine. One would have thought that, considering the nature of the ground, he would have looked up to where I was standing. But instead, he turned and looked down the railroad line. I called again. Hello, below there! Because the terrible glare of the setting sun was in my eyes, I put my left arm across my face and waved to him with my right. He looked up and and I saw on his face an expression of intense horror. He regarded me fixedly without moving. I shouted, Is there a path by which I can come down and speak to you? He continued to stare at me. Gradually, the expression of horror seemed to pass from his face, leaving it a gray, empty mask. When he spoke, his voice seemed to come from a grave. Why do you wish to speak to me? No reason. Just want to talk. If you have no reason, then please go on your way. Well, I do have a reason. Uh, let me come down and talk to you. He motioned with his little rolled-up flag to a narrow path about 200 yards distant, which descended the rocky wall of the ravine. I carefully made my way down it. The ravine was extremely deep and unusually precipitate. The man's post at the bottom was in as solitary and dismal a place as I'd ever seen. I could see the railroad tracks running into a dark, gloomy tunnel at one end of it. So little sunlight ever found its way to the spot that it had an earthy, deadly smell. And so much cold wind rushed through that it struck chill into me, as though I'd left the mortal world. Hello, I'm... I'm afraid I'm intruding. Well? I'd, I'd better explain. You see, I'm a reporter for the London Times. You know the Times. Yes, I know the Times. Oh, I'm a new man. I was assigned to do a series of stories on, on people who work at little-known occupations in the city. And strolling along, seeing you down here, I thought, well, I thought, here is a story. And that's the reason that brought you down here? Yes, sir. Uh, Perhaps I'd better ask you a few questions, hadn't I? For instance, how far down are we? I've never seen anything quite like this before. Fifty-two feet. Is that considered deep for railroad cutting? Deepest in the country. Fifty-two feet. Hmm? And and how long is the tunnel? Three quarters of a mile. I see. And that red signal light in front of the tunnel, is that part of your job? I mean, do you have to see that it stays lighted all the time? Don't you know that it is? Don't I know it is? <laughs> Look, you've been staring at me ever since... Well, ever since I called you. Staring as though I were something to be afraid of. <laughs> I'm just a newspaper reporter, that's all. I thought I'd seen you before. Seen me? But where? There. By that signal light. But I've never been here before. It's a part of London I'd never visited. No, you may be sure of that. Perhaps I may. Yes, I'm sure I may. I beg your pardon for being so unfriendly. It's just that... Well, I made a mistake. That's all right. I shouldn't have come down, I suppose. After I saw this unusual ravine in the tunnel and your job down here... 
I felt I had to come down and talk to you. I think I'm glad you did. I have very little company. This is a world here different from other men's worlds. I can believe that. May I ask, what exactly is the nature of your job? I mean, besides keeping the signal light burning and flagging the trains, what do you have to do? Not very much. I operate the telegraph in my hut over there. Turn this iron handle now and then. That's all. And you're down here all the time? Yes. Don't you ever get a chance to take a few minutes off and get up there on top? In the sunlight? Very seldom. I can't leave the telegraph. Oh, by the way, I have a fire in my signal house. Wouldn't you like to come in and warm yourself? Indeed I would. This, this wind cuts right through me. We'll hurry along. There. This will be better. Yes. I'll just put a little more wood on the fire. Poke it down. How do you stand that wind? I'm about frozen. I've been here eight or nine years, maybe ten. I'm used to the wind. It never changes. Here, take this chair close to the fire. Thank you. Tell me, don't you ever feel cut off from the world? Almost as though you were marooned and isolated down here? Yes, I do. This is a world in itself, down here. It's as wide as the tunnel is. And is high. Those are the boundaries of my world. For one hour, sometimes less, the sunlight falls into it. And at night I see the bright stars, as other men do. But that is all our two worlds hold in common. But why did you ever take such a job? Because I... Oh, excuse me. A message. Certainly. 615 Roxborough... Ten minutes late. Received message. All's well. Do you know, after talking to you, I feel as though I've at last met with a completely contented man. I believe I used to be so at one time. But now, I'm worried. Worried. About what? I don't know. It's uh, uh, difficult to explain. Perhaps I can help you. I've been thinking of that. I've been wondering. Tell me. I've got to tell someone. And yet, uh, give me some time to think it over. Say until tomorrow night, perhaps then. You mean you'd like me to come back? Yes. If it wouldn't be too much trouble. I'll be here. About the same time. But why not now... Why can't you tell me now? I want to think it over in my mind first. I want to be sure. Uh, meanwhile, let me light your way to the path. Oh, yes, of course. Uh, don't forget your pad and oh, pencil. Thank you. Oh. Dark, isn't it? Yes, be careful. Everything gets damp and slippery down here at this time of the night. <sighs> I didn't think... Fifty-two feet would make such a difference in atmosphere. There's the path. And let me ask one favor of you. Yes? When you reach the top, don't call out. Very well. And tomorrow when you come, don't call out. Tell me, what made you cry out hello below there tonight? I don't know. Did I cry something to that effect? Not to that effect. Those were the very words. I know them well. I suppose I said them because... Because I saw you below. With your left hand across your face and your right arm raised. The sunset was in my eyes. That was the only reason? <laughs> what other reason could I possibly have? You had no feeling that the words and gesture were conveyed to you in any... supernatural way? No, of course not. I see. Well, good night, then. I'll see you tomorrow night. Yes. Yes, tomorrow night. (laughs) 
That night, I slept poorly. Or rather, I didn't sleep. Because the man's face was constantly before me. And there was something in the eyes of fear, a wordless crying, agony of spirit that fevered my own brain and wouldn't let me rest. All night long, I watched the face and... Behind it was the sun going down in flames beyond the ravine, and a figure which I recognized as myself, one arm shading the eyes, the other waving and standing in the ravine and shouting, Hello below there! In the morning, my landlady awakened me. She said I'd been crying out in my sleep all night. Throughout that day, I worked with one eye on the clock, counting the hours until my appointment with the signal man. At last it came. The sun was going down again as I made my way down the path into the dank and unworldly ravine. He was waiting for me at the bottom with his white light. I didn't call to you, it's as you asked. I'm glad you didn't. I was waiting for you. Come along, we'll go into the hut and talk. It's warm there. Good. I'm glad you came. At times during the day, I feared you wouldn't. I promised you. Yes. I've made up my mind to tell you the story. Hmm. The whole thing. Sit down. Thank you. But before I do, tell me. Do you believe that I am in my right mind? Yes. Yes, I believe that. All right. Do you remember yesterday evening the fact that I took you for someone else? Yes. That's what's troubling me. The mistake, you mean? No. There's someone else I took you for. Who is he? I don't know. Well, does he look like me? I don't know. I've never seen his face. You see, the left arm is across the face, always. And the right arm is waved violently this way. It's as though he were trying to signal me. For God's sake, clear the way! Well, where do you see him? Uh... I may as well start at the beginning. One moonlight night about a year ago, I was sitting here when I heard a voice cry out, Hello, below there! It was just as you called last evening. I jumped up and looked out of the door and saw this... this... someone else standing by the red light near the tunnel, waving just as you did last night. One arm across the face, the other waving toward you? Yes, the voice seemed hoarse with shouting, and it cried, Look out! Look out! And then again, Hello, below there, look out! I caught up my lamp, turned it on, and ran toward this figure. What's wrong, I said? What's happened? He didn't speak. Stood just outside the blackness of the tunnel. I advanced so close upon it that I wondered at its keeping the, the, the arms across the eyes. I ran right up to it and had my hand outstretched to pull the arm away when it was gone. Uh, gone? Where? I don't know. I ran on into the tunnel, 500 yards maybe. I stopped and held my lamp over my head. And all I saw were the wet stains trickling down the walls. I ran out faster than I'd run in, searched the area with my light, and then came back here and, and called Burnham and said the alarm had been given anything wrong. They answered, all's well. Disregard alarm message. Well, don't you suppose you could have imagined seeing him? Yes, but you forget. I also heard him. Yes, but listen to the wind whistling through the tunnel. It sounds almost human at times. It's possible to well, imagine... Let me finish. You haven't heard the rest. Within six hours after the appearance, six hours, mind you, the 240 train came through the tunnel, slowed down and stopped. The engineer signaled me and I hurried up to the cab. What's the matter? Don't know. One of the conductors signaled for a stop. Everything all right here? Yes, just got the all clear signal. Here comes the conductor now. Hello. What's wrong back there? What did you pull the cord for? An accident. Where's the signalman around here? That's me. You have a shack nearby. Right over there. Uh, what happened, man? A woman was killed. Killed? No. She was passing between the coaches. I suppose she slipped, was caught between the couplings. But no. Nobody seems to know, sir. She was crushed horribly. On account of the other passengers, we've got to get the body off. Have them take her to my shack. You have them take her. When the shock wind 
One morning, just as day was breaking, I looked toward the red signal light and saw him again. Did he cry out this time? No. He was silent. Did he wave his arm? Yes, the right one. The left, as usual, was across his eyes. He seemed to be pointing down into the tunnel. He leaned against the shaft of the light like a... like a statue over a grave. Did anything happen? Any accident? Anything? Not immediately. He was there. I saw him. Then he was gone. I waited for the hours to pass. And when six hours went by and nothing had happened, I began to feel relieved. By nightfall, I had almost forgotten it and was able to read quite calmly as the hours passed. I was sitting here reading, the door open, when I heard a train. It was the Midnight Express from Brighton. I recognized the whistle. I got out my flag, stepped to the door. I could hear them for miles beyond the tunnel entrance. I listened to the wheels, filling the night with their driving, pounding, rhythmic beat. And I thought of the people on the train, the tired, worn-out picnickers and weekenders returning from Brighton. It made me feel responsible for them, as though I were their guardian and keeper. I listened to the rhythmic beat of the wheels. The train was nearing the tunnel mouth. I listened to the regular, powerful beat of them, and then suddenly I realized that they weren't regular. There was no rhythm, only the terrible, raging cry of a machine that has suddenly broken through its own power and is heading for destruction. <laughs> It was the worst wreck on the line. They brought the dead and dying in here. They laid them at the place where he stood waving to me that very morning. And this was the second accident after you'd seen him? Yes. And the thing that is worrying me now, he came back again a week ago. Oh. Ever since he's been there now and again by fits and starts. Standing by the left. Yes. What does he seem to do? The left arm is over the face. The right arm is waving. He seems to be trying to say, for God's sake, clear the way. I can't believe it. I have no peace or rest from it. It calls to me for many minutes together in a frightful manner. Below there, look out, look out. He stands waving to me. Oh, have you seen it tonight? No. Not yet. But will you come to the door with me and look for it now? Yes. Yes, I will. Do you see it? No. It's not there. Then let's go back. It wasn't there now, but it may be there a moment from now. What troubles me is, what does this specter mean? What is the danger? Where is the danger? There is danger overhanging somewhere on this line. Some dreadful calamity is about to happen. It's not to be doubted this third time after what has gone before. But what can I do? Nothing that I can see. If I telegraph danger, I can give no reason for it. I should get into trouble and do no one any good. They would think I was mad. I would wire danger, take care. And they would answer, what danger, where? And I would have to wire back, don't know, but for God's sake, take care. And they would, of course, discharge me. What else could they do? Yes, I, I see. When it first stood under that light, why didn't it tell me? She is going to die. Let them keep her at home. But it came the second time. Why didn't it tell me how the accident could have been averted? If it came on those occasions only to show me that its warnings were true, why doesn't it warn me plainly now? Why doesn't it tell me what is going to happen so that I can change it? Listen, there's nothing you can do. Or rather, you're doing the only thing that any sane, normal person would do, and that's nothing. The important thing is to keep your balance now. Don't get worked up to the point that... 
that if you need to act later, you won't be able to. Yes. You're right. Of course you're right. You're doing your job as well as it's humanly possible to do. You're not responsible for the future. You're responsible only for the present. What happens at this switch now? You've got to look at it that way. I know. I know. Only I can't forget that something is going to happen. I don't doubt that. But if you keep your eyes open at all times, you may be able to prevent it. I pray to God I may. It's easy to say, but... But try not to think about it too much. I try. But it's the responsibility that crushes me. Because of this specter, because of this knowledge of things that will happen along this line, I, I am responsible for every child, every mother, every person that rides upon it. I know that something is going to happen. I ought to warn them, but I don't know how to warn them when they die. If they die. Their deaths are on my shoulders. Look, would you like me to spend the rest of the night with you? Perhaps it would help keep your mind off things. No, no. No, no, thank you. I, I'll, I'll be all right. You, you don't know what a blessing it's been just to be able to tell you the whole story. Would you like me to come back tomorrow night? Would you mind? No. And when you write your story about me, about this job... Yes? If you could tell the whole story, everything, everything I've told you, it would help lift this awful responsibility from my shoulders. People would know, Ted. They, they might think me mad, but they would know. And the weight would be from my spirit. Yes, I'll write that story tomorrow. Everything. You needn't be afraid that I'll skip anything. I'll bring it along with me and show it to you before I turn it in. It would mean so much. Yes. And now, uh, I think it's best that I go. Good night, then. And you will come back tomorrow? Yes. Can you find the path? Easily. I'm beginning to know it by heart now. Good night. I went to bed immediately after returning to my lodgings. If I had slept unsoundly the night before, I slept little, if any, this night. There were the same dreams, the man's face, his eyes with their deep inner secret and pain, and in the background, the sun going down over the ravine, and the figure, no longer my own, with one arm across the eyes and the other waving toward me, crying in a low moan, Clear the way! Clear the way! In the morning, when I came to work, I felt tired, almost feverish. I hardly, could hardly wait until sundown when I would again visit the signalman. I wanted to show him the story as I'd written it. At last, the hands of the clock pointed to 6.30, and I left the office on my way to the ravine. About half an hour later, I arrived at the top of the cutting. I glanced down, and there, close at the mouth of the tunnel, I saw a man, his left arm across his eyes, passionately waving his right arm, the nameless horror that oppressed me passed in a moment, for I saw that this man was a man indeed, and that there was a little group of other men standing at a short distance to whom he seemed to be rehearsing the gesture he made. With an irresistible sense that something was wrong, with a self-reproachful fear that fatal mischief had come of my leaving the man there alone in his state of mind the night before, I descended the rocky path with all the speed I could make and, and ran up to the crowd. What's the matter here? Single man killed. When? Just a little while ago. Not the man belonging to this post? I. Not the man I know. You will recognize him, sir, if you are a friend to him. The body is over here. There. You see? Oh. How did it happen? He was cut down by the engine, sir. Just as he was lighting that red lamp. No man on the line knew his work better. But somehow he wasn't clear of the outer rail. He had the lamp in his hand ready to light it as the engine came out of the tunnel. His back was toward it and she caught him down. Ah, here's the engineer now. Tom, show him how it happened. Yes, how did it happen? I'm a reporter from the time. Well, sir, coming around the curve in the tunnel, I saw him at the end. There was no time to check the speed, but I always knew him to be very careful. 
Only this time, he didn't seem to pay any attention to the whistle. I finally shut it off when we were running down on it and called out to him. What did you say? I shouted, Hello below there! <gasps> For God's sake, the other way! You? Yes, sir. That I shouted. Oh, it was a terrible thing, sir. I never left off calling to him. Finally, I... I put the left arm across the eyes so that I wouldn't have to see. And I waved this arm to the last. But it was no use, sir. No use. No use. I walked away. I was trembling so that it took all my efforts to climb the rocky path to the top of the ravine. I knew the sun was going down in flames behind me, but I dared not look. I hurried back to my desk at the office and began writing the tragic end of the story. Sir? Yes, boy? Is your copy ready, sir? In just a moment. Please hurry, sir. Pipe it goes to press in a half hour. I'll have it ready. Come back in a few minutes. All right, sir. This, then, is the story as it was told to me and as I saw it. I make no judgment of it, no deductions. It happened. I know it happened. That is all. Except I bear with me the memory of a humble man, lonely and isolated from this world of ours, one who bore the responsibility for his fellow men so strongly on his conscience that he died from it. For I am convinced that that alone is what brought him to this end, not the train which was merely an instrument of fate. Sign. Charles Dickens. All right. You can turn them on now. You have just heard the eighth and the last in the summer series of Lights Out. Tonight's story, Charles Dickens, The Signalman, was adapted for radio by Frederick J. Lipp. Starring in the role of Charles Dickens was Nelson Armstead. The signalman was played by Herb Butterfield. Others in the cast included Boris Apland, Nathan Davis, and Jess Pugh. And now it's time to turn the lights out for the summer. We've enjoyed bringing you these shows, and if we've managed to send a few chills up and down your spine, well, that's what we set out to do. Beginning next week at this time, be sure to hear the new Judy Canova show, which returns to the air. You'll have the time of your life, so be sure to listen. Lights Out was produced and directed by Albert Cruz. That's Radio Classics for this time around. Be sure to join me again soon when I'll bring you another episode from those golden days of my favorite medium. And remember, what's old is new again at theradiodadio.com. I'm Dave Allen. <laughs>